Welcome to the Science of Fishing, where we deliver the latest reports and most up-to-date tactics to help you catch more fish. Each episode, we'll get into what's biting and break down exactly what you need to do to get out there and catch them up. Special thanks to Black Reef Spearfishing for sponsoring this podcast. Now, here's your host, Mark Farrar. All right, what's going on, everybody? We're here on the Science of Fishing. I'm here with the United States of America's uh, Women's National Spearfishing Team. Um, I'm here joined by all these lovely ladies and their coach. And I'm going to introduce you guys here to Susan, and she's going to let us know who everybody is. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Susan. Um, I run some of the uh, social media, PR, and marketing for the uh, USA Women's Spearfishing Team. I'm a spirit myself, I'm not quite as good as these awesome ladies, of course, but I'm just going to go ahead and start with introducing uh, our coach, Joe. Uh, I'll just go through and then everyone can introduce themselves. So there's there's Joe. Um, we also are joined by Julie Higgs, who's in the Miami area, um, Nicole Burko, <laughs> and Shelby Peterson. All right, sorry, awesome. I turned it over to you, Mark. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks for thanks for joining us, everybody. Um, so just so everybody gets a little bit of background that's listening at home or watching from home, these are a group of elite spear, spear fisher women, and they're headed to Laredo, Spain, to compete in the 2023 World Spear Fishing Championship on the behalf on behalf of the United States of America. Um, in the inaugural Women's World Spear Fishing Championship in Portugal in 2018. They were ch world champions, and in the second event that took place in 2021, they took second place. So we're hoping 2023 we come back with the gold again, um, and these lovely ladies can make something beautiful happen again. Um, as you guys know, it's National Women's History Month, so what's more fitting than having the USA National Women's Team um, here with us today? So... Just to give a little bit of background, some of the team members, some of them are USA national championships, uh, national champions, IUSA world record holders. So we have some very well qualified individuals here with us today to talk about spear fishing, to talk about, you know, the sustainability of how spear fishing is and just in general about their experiences and how they grew up and how they got into spear fishing and just the beautiful world of the ocean that we we've all come to know and love. So I'm going to switch over to some questions for you guys, you know, first and foremost, what are some of the challenges that you guys face as a women's team and honestly a male dominated sport, you know, um, not sure who wants to answer that, but you guys can go ahead and, uh, someone, you know, Julie. Uh, well, in I, I don't really know how to answer that. I would say I haven't had to too many issues. Sorry. Oh no, I was going to say, do you want me to go first while you think of your? Sorry, while you think yes. of your answer. Um, no, no, no. Uh, well, you know, I feel like now there's actually a lot less um, boundaries to entry. But initially, when I started, when I got into the sport, um, oh man, like 15 years ago or so. Uh, there was a lot, there wasn't social media like, like there is now where you can really like find people who are doing all of the, all, you know, doing all the diving. So initially, you know, finding that group um, and it's usually like a boys club and, you know, getting, uh, you know, network, networking to get on boats and things is, I think, the biggest initial hurdle. Um, and, you know, um, I feel like being a woman was a little bit, it was a little bit difficult to um, facilitate that initially. Whereas now I think with social media, um, it's it's so easy to find other women that dive. Well, that's great. I, I mean, care. yeah, I think the networking thing absolutely through social media kind of helps out. And um, there's, a, there's a lot of respect here. Nicole, you have, you got second place in 2021 with the team, right? And um, you're a two-time, uh, world record holder. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, I have the uh, uh, world record for um, Cuba, Pacific Kubera snapper, which is 69 pounds. 
wow. um, which was, I was really stoked about. Um, I think the person who held that before me was Sherry Day at 45 pounds. So it was a really exciting record. Um, and then uh, I have the uh, pole spear record for red snapper. Um, it's at 26 pounds, which initially when I caught it, beat the men's record on pole spear, which I was really excited about, <laughs> but it's since been beaten. <laughs> um, okay. Man, no, it's still up for women, uh, but uh, for men, uh, somebody just beat that. And then, um, and then I, yeah, and then I got second place at both of the national uh, competitions um, uh, at the last two tournaments. So how, how you qualify for the team is, is your ranking um, at, na at the nationals over the last two years. Yeah, I was going to ask, how exactly does one get on the team? You know, you guys, how did you guys all come together to become this cohesive unit and, you know, get all around and become this, this team? It's all about your placement at nationals. So, okay. um, yeah. When does nationals take place usually? Uh, it varies, but it's once a year. Um, and then, so I think uh, now it's going to be in Kona. Um, last year it was in Lake Powell. And then um, previously uh, it was in Stewart. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. So it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Very cool. So anybody else, you know, want to talk about their experience um, yeah. being a woman in, in spearfishing? Go ahead. I think for me, I'm, I'm in Utah. So out here, pretty much nobody knows what spearfishing is. <laughs> and so as a woman and in spearfishing in a landlocked state, it's completely different because I agree with Nicole with social media, it's gotten a way more widespread. I'm in the coasts so florida california all up the coasts i feel like it's really spread and it has too in freshwater and in landlocked states but it's gone from just me to like two others and so the only opportunity i really have to see women really perform in this sport is when the saltwater women come to kind of the freshwater environment which was a super fun thing um lake powell um but that's really the only only the the only time I ever really see other women diving. Um, otherwise, it's just me and the guys. So um, I really am excited to be on this team because I've never had an opportunity like this. Um, and so I'm I'm just stoked to be with other ladies and, and get to see how they do it because it's just been me and the guys the last eight years I've been diving. So I'm pretty stoked. Sure, sure. That's, that's pretty awesome. You know, you don't hear of a lot of people freshwater spearfishing you know, um, how, how different is it? Do you believe than saltwater? Do you believe, is it just, is it in the winter, obviously it's colder or how, what are the tactics? You know, is there, it's cause it's not, I don't know if there's so much of a reef system, like you're going and down, you're going to shoot a grouper in a hole or you're going to shoot a snapper in a hole or whatever you're going for. How different is it in freshwater? What are you looking for? What are you exactly, what's your, your hunting strategy when you're in freshwater? Yeah, I think in freshwater, the only difference is, is just learning the personality of the different fish, just like you would in saltwater. In saltwater, you're gonna have different species and different kinds of fish that act different ways. And it's the same exact thing for freshwater. So you just learn the species and their behavior and where they like to be. And, and it's essentially the same idea, but less salty and no sharks. So. <laughs> That's awesome. So That's we awesome. all as a team, act, well, not as a team, but uh, individually, we all ended up competing. And well, so the last nationals was in freshwater. So that was my first time diving freshwater. And I actually had a really good time. It was so beautiful being in Lake Powell. Um, and so one big part of the tournaments there, though, is carp fishing and it's invasive. So typically, you know, we're all we're being conservative with what, you know, there's all these restrictions on size and what you can shoot. Um, but with carp, they're invasive. Like, I think it's actually illegal to release a carp back if you didn't spear it. But if you caught it rod and reel, I think it's like illegal to release it back in the lake. Um, so it's like all about quantity and you kind of like unleash on these on these invasive carp um and it was it was uh, a really unique experience and i actually 
um, really enjoyed it, um, you know, that we got to help um, the situation in Lake Powell that's kind of overrun with the carp. So that that's was really awesome. Fun. Yeah, and I mean, hey, go ahead. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit more about that. So I know, I know Nicole and I and Shelby are all doing freshwater worlds and we'll be targeting carp, striper, catfish, and walleye. But the striper and the, and the carp are definitely, there's no limit on these fish because they want those fish out of the lake. The carp and Lake Powell are in direct competition for the most, building, the most basic building blocks of the lake and that's zooplankton. Carp also eat all the aquatic vegetation that are indigenous um, for the species. This, the local species use it for spawning. And the striped bass were introduced with the idea that they should not have a successful spawn, uh, but they nature found a way and they overpopulated very quickly. The striped bass favorite food is shad and shad eat the zooplankton. So basically the, the overpopulation of striped bass and carp, the, the lake is considered starving. So while we're there, they have no limit on those fish. They want us to shoot as many as possible to help make the lake a little healthier. Gotcha, that's awesome. So that kind of leads me into like the next question or next topic that I want to talk about is the sustainability of spearfishing. You know, you guys are getting out there, you're eradicating the problem that's out there. But then when you transition to saltwater spearfishing, it's a whole different ball game. You can't just, obviously you guys know, but so for the people at home, you can't just get out there and kill everything in sight when, you know, there's limits and regulations and sometimes there's, you know, you see a mutton, but it's underside. You can't just shoot it or whatever the species may be. Can you guys talk to me a little bit about the sustainability and how you guys strive to be uh, sustainable while spearfishing, especially in the saltwater aspect. A lot of you guys are based down in Florida. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, I see you raising your hand. Go ahead. Um, yeah, that's a that's a that's a certain area that I feel very strong about. I think I think um, the spearfishing community is starting to really understand sustainability. Um, uh, in my world of investments, we you, you probably hear of ESG, environmental uh, governance, uh, sustainability and governance. Uh, there's trillions and trillions of dollars going into this uh, space of uh, basically making corporations worldwide, multiple corporations uh, responsible for how they treat the environment and so forth. We see it in the news all the time, obviously, with the electrification of cars and so forth. And yesterday we had a, a huge uh, passage of uh, ocean protection. I'm sure everybody's seen it on the news, but it was a very, very strong package uh, to help protect the oceans. So that that is an area that's uh, uh, very dear and close to me. Um, the oldest of the group, I'm 60 years old, and I uh, started uh, working in a dive shop when I was 18. I've seen the reefs for the last 40 years, and I've seen some of the changes. Um, I can say, though, that uh, one thing that I'm very impressed with is, uh, believe it or not, is that the United States has a very conscious uh, fisheries management. And if you compare it to many other countries, uh, a lot of their shores and uh, fishing is devastated because of, uh, of not having rules and regulations. So I am a firm believer that good fish management is a win-win for everybody. It allows us to enjoy the sport and to have uh, generations uh, coming up like these young ladies to uh, still enjoy uh, fishing, you know, regardless of the type of fishing. Obviously, we're more involved in the spear fishing. Um, but I'd have to challenge uh, uh, all other types of, of, of fishing. I think ultimately spear fishing is the most sustainable way of fishing. For sure. Why? Because we we see the fish, we we determine if it's uh, if it's the right fish to catch, and at that point is that we pull the trigger. So we don't have, we probably have the least bycatch of any fishing out there, commercial, uh, line fishing, you name it. So I think this needs to be brought to the forefront, and people need to understand that uh, the spear fishing community, when they exercise sustainability, uh, which we do, uh, is the most uh, sustainable method of spearfishing, of fishing, period. And that's something that um, 
I believe uh, spearfisher women and men need to adopt and also get the word out. Uh, unfortunately, uh, sometimes they see us as the guys that are coming into the roof, reef and killing all the fish. And, you know, we're up there with these big, uh, beautiful fish uh, caught all over the world. Uh, but that's not the case. Uh, every uh, spearfishing uh, person, woman or man, follows the rules and they are catching those fish uh, within the rules and the guidelines of those particular uh, f fisheries. And um, the United States being <clears throat> the coveted place to do business worldwide because of our laws, I think we set it a very good example on a worldwide basis that uh, good management of fisheries make a difference. Um, so I, I have to say that I'm proud to be an American for many other reasons, but one of the other reasons I'm very proud to be an American is that our fishing management uh, works, our fishing management works. So sustainability is a very important topic that I wanna keep in the forefront and, and let everybody know that we are conscious of our environment and wanna protect the environment. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I would ahead, second Nicole. that. Um, I think that I'm really proud of um, the fisheries management that we, that we have. Obviously there's gonna be uh, you know, you can always do better, but um, if, if I think a lot of us on the team have traveled um, to different countries and, you know, it's, it's wild, the, the variation in like, you know, you can see when something, uh, when a place is struggling, uh, you know, there's places in the world where you can go, where you can literally chum all day and, and you won't see a shark. There just, there just are no sharks there. I mean, you shoot, <laughs> that's one thing that's really healthy in Florida is that, uh, you know, you might want to wear a shark shield because uh, we have a, I mean, at least residential sharks, um, some migratory sharks, you really don't see too often, but uh, as far as resident sharks, um, you know, you shoot a fish, you maybe, uh, me and Julie sometimes will get like one or two drops, one or two fish, and then you got to go to a new spot because um, there are sharks there. Um, but I'd like uh, to add to, to Nicole. Nicole just brought out a good point. By the way, sharks are becoming a, a problem. I, I, I guess the research is out there. Maybe Susan could speak to this, but I just uh, there was something on, on Fox yesterday about all these sharks off of uh, the west coast of Florida. And what happens is, I can't remember the name of the act, but there was an act that protected the sharks, which I, I'm all about protecting species. But unfortunately, sometimes, uh, depending on the regulatory body, uh, sometimes they go overboard and, and uh, the protection of the sharks has now become a problem. And um, I suspect, for what Nicole has reported and, and experiences that uh, Julie has had and Susan, I suspect that we, we may be going in that direction where we may have to open up the sharks again just to bring them bring a population under control. But again, Susan will probably be, be, better speak to that. Well, I do know that a lot of, especially on like the East Coast, Jupiter, West Palm, there are several recreational dive charters, dive agencies that regularly go out and do recreational shark dives, which uh, you know, generally I don't have a problem with, but unfortunately they're feeding the sharks. And so they're teaching the sharks to associate divers, you know, scuba divers, free divers, even, you know, swimmers and snorkelers um, to associate that kind of uh, activity in the water with food. Um, we haven't, I don't believe, at least to my knowledge, we don't have any recreational shark um dives on the Gulf Coast, probably because we have a pretty big spearfishing community and they'd be, you know, they'd be shut down pretty quickly. But, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, at least in the Gulf Coast too, you know, Gulf Coast too, you know, if I, I typically see a shark every, at least every third drop. Sometimes we get in the water and they're already there. Um, it's just, you know, over the, you know, the 10 or so years that I've lived in the, the Gulf area, you know, there, there are just more and more, more sharks. Um, most of the time they leave you alone, but, you know, there have been a couple that, you know, they just really, they don't leave you alone. Um, so. 
it can be a little scary sometimes. I think uh, <laughs> we, we've all got our, uh, me, Julie, um, you know, I think all, the whole team has uh, posted a bunch of like shark videos of like getting chased back to the boat. But I mean, that said, you know, uh, we're in their waters. I mean, I think, you know, what we, uh, for the most part, we all just uh, follow the science and, you know, um, we have a great fish, we have great fisheries management and, um, you know, sharks are just, and you know, they're another fish in the ocean. So a hundred percent, you know, you hear a lot about the sharks, especially, you know, hook and line fishermen as well. A lot of, a lot of guys are going out there. They're trying to catch kingfish, wahoo, uh, the tunas, the black fins. I personally have had a lot of experiences with half a fish coming back or, you know, uh, just a head coming back. It becomes, a, I think it has become a little bit of an issue, but like you said, Nicole, we got to trust the science. We got to trust our fisheries. We got to trust the sustainability and, you know, we got to, we got to just maintain and see what the next step is in, uh, in regulating the sharks and the, the fish that we're going to be encountering. Um, kind of a transition point um, I wanted to talk about is, what is like you, what is one of the most memorable experiences for you guys as a team? You know, not just on an individual basis, but like when you guys compete together, what is one of those moments where it stands out for you guys and, and that's been incredible for you? Well, I mean, we haven't really gone out like, I mean, individually, you know, like I'm friends with, you know, I've gone diving with uh, Julie and I've gone right. diving with Rosie and, you know, I, I, uh, you know, got to meet Shelby at the last uh, nationals um, that was at Lake Powell. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, together so far, um, you know, we haven't really, I mean, it's been more of like a coming together to, you know, plan and strategize. Sure. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that um, as far as diving with people independently, you know, um, there's so much trust that you have, you know, that I, you know, if I go down for a fish, you know, and a shark's coming up, uh, you know, Julie, you'll go, to, you know, it, it's, um, something that's interesting is you have to kind of like put pressure on the, or, you know, like the sharks are very opportunistic. So if it's just you in the water and you with your little fish, and then you're trying to like get back to the boat and your buddy's not paying attention, that can be a little bit of a, a, a little bit more of a scary ordeal versus like Julie's oh, yeah. right there. And she's going to come and she's going to like just her facing the shark, you know, and being beside me, it makes a world of difference as far as that pressure and the sharks, um, just like how close the shark will come. Right, right. So a, a lot of people don't understand and correct me if I'm wrong. Again, you guys are way more experts at this than I am, but people don't understand that you always got to have a dive buddy. You got to have communication someone's got to be up while you're down and vice versa and watching your back. How does that play into you guys at the tournaments? So like, how does the teamwork and communication work out? Do you guys pair up and go out or how does it work with like within a tournament for you guys when you, when you so prepare and communicate? Within the tournaments, it's actually. Um, and so I have some experience like com commercial dive uh, diving and it's it's a little bit more similar to what so when you're in this tournament there's actually nobody diving so all of our teamwork happens in the like more foundational stages and then like you know we're going to collaborate as far as you know sharing information about like how fish behavior sharing information about like let's okay let's cover all of the areas of the zone uh, but on game day it's actually just us individually in the water we're not allowed to have a spotter we're not allowed to have anyone there with us people historically do die in these tournaments I'm, so i was gonna to ask give you, yeah to give you a right, quick, go ahead go, go ahead yeah mark um just to give you a quick history the the world championship started in 1959 uh most most of these tournaments have been done in europe uh we've yet to bring uh the world championship to the united states and that's a uh, um, one of the goals that I have uh, as a, a participant in, in various uh, uh, world championships, but the the way it's developed in in Europe, it's it's pretty much an individual sport. Although that there's still a team uh, component where you win as a team, but you're also ranked as individually. And the way they do it in Europe is each competitor, and there's 25 countries around the world that compete. 
and the women just opened up in 2018. But out of those 25 countries, you got three primary uh, um, uh, uh, participants that compete, and each one has their own boat. And uh, usually a, a, a person on the boat that helps them with gear and things of that nature, but they cannot be uh, assisted while, while in the water. Obviously, they do follow safety protocols. So the captain who's running the boat and the person who's on the boat is always watching the, uh, the diver and are ready to go in the water in the event of a shallow water blackout, which is the biggest right. uh, issue that uh, spear fishermen uh, deal with. But really, it's be, it's uh, uh, when it's tournament day, each participant is on their own. And that goes the same for the women. Uh, they're following the same rules. And all this is uh, um, covered by CMOS, which is the uh, uh, federal uh, or the European uh, uh, underwater um, organization that oversees that. In the United States, we have the Underwater Society of America which also handles uh, um, uh, underwater hockey, rugby, and fin swimming. Uh, and spearfishing is the fourth sport under that umbrella. So our regulatory body, which is connected to the Olympics, is part of the regulatory body that sanctions the, uh, the sport. Uh, they're the ones who sanction the nationals in the United States, which is rotated between uh, Hawaii, the west coast of the United States, uh, the Great Lakes, uh, and, and then the east coast of the United States, both south and north. Um, so again, it's an individual sport. Uh, it's a controversial situation. They've talked a, a great deal about pairing people for safety, having two divers in the water, but I, I don't know if that's going to be uh, changed anytime soon. Uh, but again, there is some safety measures currently and you're correct. Um, when spearfishing, you should always have a buddy. It's highly recommended. Um, so, uh, and, and many a times, uh, from my experience, I think a two-person team is the ideal team because you don't have a, uh, uh, you don't have a, you don't have to guess if if that third person is the one who's watching you at that point or not. When you have a two-man team, and again, this is my opinion for what I've seen through the years, is you know you had that other buddy there. Um, and it does make a considerable difference in the in, in the, your ability to bring in fish when you have someone who's diving with you that you know well and you know their capabilities. So when you're diving with someone who who's a great uh, diver, it gives you a, a higher level of confidence uh, and allows you to to I, I believe at times to even perform better. Um, so I certainly perform better. I mean, you know, you could have, there's so many instances where like you can help someone like me and Julie have gone out and, you know, she'll be, she'll be kicking and like, you know, the fish will be holed up and I'll be like holding the line and like, she'll go down or I'll go down. And it's like you, you teamwork, you know, a hole or, you know, one person spots something, but they're out of air. And then your buddy goes down to, to go shoot it. I mean, I just want to be clear that, um, you know, despite the fact that, uh, you know, we're not able to have a buddy for this competition. I think that diving with a buddy is always the best, safest, uh, smartest way to dive. Right. Do you think that, you know, this question for all of you guys, do you think that going solo into these competitions and diving solo, you have a different mindset than, I don't, I'm not sure if the, U, if the U.S. competitions, you have a buddy with you or not, or if it's a similar type of uh, solo dive but do you think going into these dives you have a different mindset of I need to be safe first and foremost you know the fish we're going to try to get the fish but it's this is a different game this is a different ball game kind of going solo yeah well I, I I'll add to that Mark it's a solo type you know spearfishing one of the most rewarding things about spearfishing is you're there with the environment I mean, it's right. good to have a buddy, but at the end of the day, all spearfishing uh, athletes are completely resilient and a hundred percent, they know that at the end of the day, they have to be uh, responsible for their own lives. I don't think there's any uh, uh, spearfisher person, uh, man or woman out there that does not take that into their psyche or their mindset. So when you're in the water, you're always looking after number one. It's always good to have other people there uh, sure. and, and it adds an additional confidence level and it allows you to land more fish. But at the end of the day, the people that spearfish at the level that these ladies are spearfishing, 
these these ladies are very self re resilient. You can literally drop them anywhere, and they they'll figure it out. They've fished in all kinds of waters, uh, you know, murky waters. Uh, they've fished in in choppy seas. I mean, they all all the women. I have to speak for all of them here. I'd say are, are very very experienced. They they've been in just any type of condition. So they know they have to be resilient and you have to be when you're in the ocean. So that's one thing that every that, that every spear fishing person will develop. And it's very, very important because uh, you have to have that type of resiliency. Of course, of course, that makes sense. I mean, yeah, I, you're hundred percent right. I feel like absolutely you have to take care of you number one and think about that every dive and every time you're going down. Um, so what kind of like precautions then do you guys think you take while diving? Um, you know, for people, again, that are novices and listening, what would you say is maybe the number one thing that you would advise a novice going into one of their first dives and how to, you know, is it to be aware of their surroundings, to not push themselves too hard? What would be the, the most important thing? First yeah. of all, I'd, I'd recommend no novice go solo diving. I mean, that is something, um, 100%. even, you know, even when you are uh, very familiar with your body, even when you're really familiar with diving, even when you know what to anticipate, um, you know, accidents still happen. So, you know, all you can do is, you know, we can be a little foolish and we can mitigate our risks as much as possible. But I mean, truly diving with a buddy uh, for someone that's a novice, I highly recommend going out with someone who's much better than yourself. That's how you get better. Um, you know, go, we, I think we've all gone out with uh, GR Tar and <laughs> all these like legends in the sport and Joe, people, all these people who've like, you know, I remember uh, I was, I went out spear fishing with Joe when I was new and a liability and, <laughs> and this is like 15 years ago, but, uh, you know, that's, that's the way to get better. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, that makes a hundred percent of sense. So get out with someone that knows what they're doing, basically. Oh, and everything and everything in life. Go, yeah. go learn from people who are better than you. Well, I have a question then for Shelby. Shelby, you said you're pretty much the only one over there out in Utah. What, what you said you dive with the guys, right? Is that really how you got into it? Or how did all of this come about for you being in the landlocked state? Yeah, so um, my husband now, uh, when I met him and started dating him, he he was the one that had found spearfishing and had gotten into it and had learned that he could spearfish in Utah and um, because somebody reached out to him about invasive goldfish in a pond so and him and his buddies were like can we get in and try to stab these goldfish um, and this is when he was in high school 17 um, and that's just where the mindset goes obviously is can we stab them <laughs> for a 17 year old boy um, but then he actually found out that that's a real sport uh, and he didn't really know. Uh, and then when I met him several years later, he said, hey, would you ever want to get in the water and shoot fish? And I grew up um, in a family that hunted in a family that fished in the hook and line traditional way. And I was on a swim team and I'm like, get in the water and get fish. That sounds amazing. Yes, absolutely. I'll do that. Um, and so I happened to get into the sport because of him. And then we both kind of grew up with the freshwater community because when we started, it wasn't really a thing. <laughs> it was it was in the regulations that you could spearfish, but not a lot of people even knew what that was and just kind of skipped past that. Um, a huge help in that is Mike McGuire. He's a huge, um, I guess, voice in the freshwater community, but he comes from the saltwater community and has been spearfishing for years and his job brought him to Colorado and he didn't want to stop. And so he's really built up that community and, and I've been able to meet these great legends, like Nicole said, and that's how I learned, was, was meeting people that kind of came from the saltwater world but didn't want to let it go. Um, and that's brought me to compete a ton in freshwater and also in the ocean now that I've been spearfishing for a while. Absolutely. Well, another question for you then, you're over in Utah, so it gets cold in the winter. Um, 
how do you you know most right of, now <laughs> yeah how, most of us are in florida you know we can kind of spearfish all year round how do you deal with the elements over in utah pretty much once the water's frozen you have to go to where it's not um but then that brings in a whole new difficulty is i i cannot afford to go to florida or california um all the time to go and keep spearfishing during the winter. So really what it is, is you just train. So I, I work out every day. I do my, my breath hold tables. I go and do statics in a pool um, with my husband. I do what I can other than diving because the lakes are literally frozen. <laughs> so um, I, I can't, uh, once they aren't frozen, we'll, we'll get back in, we'll put on our seven millimeter wetsuits and we'll, we'll get in the frozen water. <laughs> but until then we're, we're stuck in a pool. So, and at What's the, gym. the cold. Yeah. What's the coldest water you say you, you've gotten into? Um, for me, I want to say the coldest that I was in was 39 degrees. Ooh. That's colder than me. That's <laughs> cold. You're bold. <laughs> I want nothing to do with that water. <laughs> <laughs> that has not happened very often, but when when you really love diving, you want to get in the water anyways. Jeez. I'm sure that seven mil suit kept you kind of warm, but not too warm. <laughs> you, you instead of lasting hours, you you last 30, 45 minutes. But 30, 45 minutes, in my opinion, is way better than not being in the water. Right. Right. <laughs> That's awesome. It just means you're passionate about it. That's sweet. I well, also, oh, I was going to say about the cold water, having a custom suit really makes a huge difference for that too. Because once you start getting into these really cold temperatures, when you have like a little pocket of, I mean, for men, it's not this, I guess it's not as big as a deal, but for women, if we get a little pocket of water, cold water or something, it's just like, <laughs> it wrecks your day. <laughs> not fun. <laughs> I think it's good. It's the same for men. I'll tell you that. <laughs> when it's cold, sure. it's cold. Sure. Do you guys ever uh, try to get over to the Bahamas together or anything like that? I know at least you guys down in South Florida or you guys mainly just practice over in the coast here on the East Coast or the West Coast. I, uh, oh, you're back. <laughs> there she is. Well, Jimmy. I my phone overheated. I'm sitting in my car and it like completely turned off for a few seconds. But anyway, uh, Nicole and I have been diving for a long time and we haven't been to the Bahamas together, but I actually went to California a few years ago to spend some time with my sister. And it was kind of funny because I was not anticipating leaving the country. So I sent my passport to get renewed. And the second I land, Nicole, who had found a mutual friend of mine called me. She's like, Hey, uh, I want to go to Mexico. You want to go? I'm like, I don't have my passport. And our <laughs> adult, he's like, you don't need a passport to go to Mexico. I'm like, I feel like I do, <laughs> but luckily global entry card. And that was accepted at the border. So super last minute, Nicole and I and our friend Dalton ended up trailering a boat down to Mexico and went spearfishing for several days and came back. So I, I can't speak on the Bahamas. I've been to the Bahamas several times. I don't know about the other ladies, but Nicole and I have definitely made some pretty crazy trips together. <laughs> yeah. What did you guys, what were you guys shooting down there? Is that where you got the record? The uh, Cabrera? No, no, that was in Costa Rica. Um, okay. But uh, we shot some, we shot some nice fish. What do we shoot, Julie? Like some groupers and uh, yeah. What, what do you? There's that snapper that's like specific. It's like a what's the Free, well, there Cabria Pargo. Yeah, Pargo Rojo, I think. What was it? Pargo Rojo, maybe. Yeah, down there they name everything. Pargo is snapper in Spanish. Yeah, and they but it's like the, it's got this little dot. It's not a mutton, but it's got like a dot. Oh, I have a picture of it. <laughs> Similar. Rosie Snapper? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. with that. Well, how often do you guys go for pelagics versus reef fish? Or is it mainly reef spear fishing for all y'all? I mean, I think I, it's pretty seasonal. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, yeah. We have a and what we're most likely to get. Like we'll catch wind of a dolphin run. So we'll go after pelagics or a wahoo run in the keys. So we'll go down there and target those fish. 
um, reef fish, if grouper and hogfish are closed, like, you know, what are we really targeting snapper? So it kind of depends on what's open and what's running and who's willing to go out. <laughs> sure. Sure. Well, do you guys have any, anybody have any, uh, stories they want to share any highlights of their spearfishing career, you know, any of you guys, you guys all have records, I believe. So if anybody wants to share an awesome story, we'd love to hear it. Mark, Mark if I can intervene real quick before we jump into that, I just want to do a, yeah, yeah. a, a, a quick plug in. Uh, funny you asked that question. We're having, uh, I belong to uh, one of the South Florida clubs and some of the ladies will be present. But on April 8th this year, uh, we're going to have a Blue Water Invitational, which is a purely pelagic tournament. Um, so um, that uh, was brought into our uh, realm uh, by uh, the founder of the club, Mike Schmidt. Uh, he, he did a lot of California and Baja and um, offshore tuna um, spearfishing. So he came up with the idea and we've had a couple already. Now we're having one in, in April. 8th so um we have brought the blue water component into spearfishing and i think it's it's taking uh more people are are getting into the blue water um spearfishing uh scene so there is some growth in that area for spirals just want to add to that sure yeah blue water it's cool it's scary you look down and you see nothing but when you see those fish come by it's pretty epic yeah. you either it's fish or no fish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're just looking into an abyss half the time, but sometimes it's it's awesome. But yeah, so anybody have any stories? You know, you're looking into the abyss and a wahoo comes up or a big ass tuna just comes blowing by. <laughs> so I have, uh, and this kind of plays on, I mean, I knew earlier you were asking about like advice kind of stuff and like uh, as far as, um, safety stuff uh, another thing is to like always have a knife that's not like just for braining your fish that's also for in case you become tangled um so uh if you guys <laughs> ever watch the spearfishing adventures of judah clark there's a really good video of me like almost dying it was like <laughs> where it was uh i mean i laughed but it was quite scary at the time and it was such a a rookie mistake you know because you know, if I was going for tuna or something, I would constantly be checking the float line, but it was a, a rig that I wasn't really familiar with. It was somebody else's gear. Um, you know, we were pole spearing that same day I caught my world record red snapper, but earlier that day I had gone to shoot uh, a snapper and I'm like literally like half a wrap got caught around me. Um, and before I could even do anything, uh, you know, the red snapper had been attacked by a shark. I just immediately, boom, I boom, I shoot a red snapper, boom, it's attacked by a shark. I'm getting dragged down, you know, but luckily, you know, I have my knife, I have my knife out. And, you know, by, by the time I went to go cut it, the, the shark had already, you know, luckily the shark had like eaten it off, off the spear. But, you know, just having that safety gear there is so, so important. <laughs> um, so, and, and another thing I would highly recommend that I noticed a lot of people don't do is one, you're never going to, like most people aren't going to sharpen their knives. So you've got to have a serrated edge on your knife. One of the sides has to be serrated because you need something that's going to like cut through something you, you might have to cut through monofilament you might have to cut through a float line sure you think you're going to sharpen your knife you're it, but you know do you really want like the test of whether you sharpen your knife to be like when you're you know in a panic so yeah anyway. for sure you don't want to be in that life or death situation and yeah <laughs> like oh it's not sharp <laughs> well <laughs> so that's on the internet if you want to watch me like almost die and catch a world record <laughs> all right <laughs> i'll definitely check that one out but thank god you're still here <laughs> yes thank you <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, let's hear it <laughs> so i have a lot of stories so it's hard to just pick one but the one that comes to mind when everybody asks me this question i was in the san Blas islands with my family my dad and my sister on our sailboat uh, a couple of years ago 
and the reef, the San Blas Islands are, are off of Panama. And the reef there is absolutely gorgeous, but would not have the fish on it that you would think you would see. I, I've heard it, it's hit by uh, transient commercial fishermen pretty hard. So we basically went out to this absolutely gorgeous reef and, and shot a few trigger fish um, and came back a little, uh, a little disappointed. And my sister and I are cleaning fish and we're throwing the fish carcasses into the water behind the boat. And these two big Kubera come in right under the boat. These, these are fish we were hoping to see on the reef and didn't. And here we are at our anchorage and they're right, right under the boat. And anybody who spear fishes knows that Kibera snapper are pretty smart fish, especially once they start getting bigger. Uh, getting close to these fish is pretty difficult. So I had my sister continue to clean fish and we were on this slope. So it kind of dropped from like eight feet down to maybe 50 feet. It was a pretty drastic slope right behind the boat. So I tried to stay shallow. I would have her throw the fish. Uh, I would lay down there and like 10 feet, have her flow the fish, the fish carcasses, they land right on top of me. And there was a couple times the Kibera came in pretty close, but not close enough to where I felt that I had a good shot because Kibera have very thick skin. And then we did this for over an hour and I really didn't want to take a bad shot. I wanted it to be one good shot. And finally, a bunch of nurse sharks came in and they were rolling around with the carcasses and it stirred up this cloud of sand and I went and I laid in the cloud of sand until a fish got close enough and I shot this cabera. And at that time, my sister was in the water with me and she put a second shot in it and we got the fish. And it was just such an awesome experience because I worked for over an hour to get this fish. Nobody thought I would ever actually get it. The water is so crystal clear. This fish just didn't want to come anywhere near me. I got lucky with the, with the nurse sharks stirring up the sand and I landed this fish and it was far more than we could eat or store so we took it to the island and we ended up feeding families on the island and they cooked for us and we all ate together and I have this all on video on my YouTube but it was just a really it was the best day of the trip um a species that I've, I've only shot a handful of cabera and that's the biggest one I've gotten so far so it was just a really good trip and a really good memory that's awesome. That's, a, that's an amazing story. How big was the Kubera? We didn't weigh it. I think it was probably, I don't know, around 25, 30 pounds. That's a big Not, snapper. Nicole's record, but it's still a nice fish. No, yeah, that's absolutely a nice fish. I mean, that's a fish some people dream of. So <laughs> that's, that's incredible. And that's, Shelby, and that's great for folks oh, here too. Like, that's, so hers was on pole spear, mine was on gun. Um, I was I, on gun. Pardon? I was on gun. Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought you. We had been talking about Bahamas earlier, so I didn't really. I forgot you went. You were in Santa. Sorry. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's awesome. Um, what yeah. was it? Oh, something that she made me think of before you move on to Shelby and her story yeah, yeah. is. Um, you know, I think it's important to mention that, you know, the, you see these giant large fish and a lot of people go like, oh my God, there's no way you could eat all of that fish. It must be going to waste. We all have like vacuum sealers <laughs> and like and giant breathers and like, you know, and, and also you end up making so many friends because, you know, it's one, like, you know, you give some to your neighbor, you give some to like people that you know your acquaintances with and it's really wonderful because people really appreciate the fish and you just like I don't know it facilitates all these friendships so absolutely no and I think that that plays into the sustainability thing you know when people see fishermen spear fishermen spear fisherwoman everybody just catching these big fish they're like what are you going to do with all that well you got family and friends and it sustains everybody and you know what we don't have to go kill more animals we have this animal that we harvested and properly took care of and you know everybody gets to enjoy the fruits of our labor at the end of the day which is awesome yeah. but yeah Shelby Susan Joe you guys got any stories you know I'm sure people at home would love to hear it 
compared to these ladies, especially, I don't have a ton of saltwater experience, um, but that just makes the my experiences in the saltwater stick out. <laughs> um, but I had the opportunity a few years ago, I want to say it was 2019, to qualify for Freshwater Worlds, um, and that was held in New Zealand, which was awesome. And I was blessed enough to be able to to go and compete with my husband in that, um, which was fine. It was in a cool pond and shoot a bunch of tiny catfish. Um, but what I really remember from that trip was we spent most of the time in the ocean because it's New Zealand. <laughs> and that's that's like a dream to go to go over there and and see how they do things. Um, but just making friends with people and 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 getting to experience that. Um, but that was probably my my first like elongated experience in the ocean was in a different country and so um, out there just getting to learn the behaviors of fish the name of fish uh, what I can and cannot shoot the regulations um, but they have kingfish out there which is pretty much like a big yellow tail um, and one of the coolest experiences I have was being out with my husband we were out in pretty shallow water and kind of looking more for snapper but a whole school of kingfish came came in and um, I'm this freshwater pretty new still <laughs> um, in ocean diving and there's these huge fish and I just like I, I don't know how else to describe it other than buck fever <laughs> because I'm a hunter too um, but it's just like oh my gosh here's the big fish um, what do I do what do I do and my husband shoots one and he's like, hey, it's your opportunity. They came back around to see what had just happened. And I and I shoot at this fish and just completely miss. Um, it's the ocean, the water's so clear. And I'm like, this fish has to be super close to me. It was nowhere near <laughs> as close as I thought. Um, but I had somebody else throw me a gun and was able to remaneuver and use the flopper to actually get it to come look at what I was and and get a really good shot on it um and that was probably my favorite ocean fish that I've been able to get um and I was just stoked the rest of the day uh and it was just a super fun experience but out in New Zealand we couldn't take the fish home kind of like Nicole said and so we we ended up taking a few steaks to enjoy some of it um but the rest was donated to just people in need in New Zealand um and they they were thrilled too and just being able to use that fish to feed other people, but also get my pictures and get my experience um, was probably one of the most memorable times that I've ever had. Absolutely, that's a, that's an awesome story. I mean, not a lot of people get to say they went spear fishing in New Zealand, you know, let alone on that side of the world where we're from over here. Um, that's incredible. I'd love to get out there sometime. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people would love to. That's an awesome story. That's great. So you got two shots at the fish. You hit the second one and that's sweet. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Anybody else? Uh, well, I, I'll tell you, I've, I got, I got, I got, I think I have uh, an advantage. I've been in the water for a long time now and I have many stories, um, which is, I guess, one of the advantages being an older person. Uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, <laughs> I usually use a Hawaiian sling and been able to, to land the grouper. My largest grouper was 60 pounds. Wow. Um, and uh, that was pretty epic. I've been able to duplicate that many a times. Uh, but I have to say, uh, God, many of them. One most recently that helped me win a tournament uh, was shooting a cobia on the run, a very long shot with a Hawaiian sling off a... Uh, off the uh, uh, back of a uh, of a uh, bull shark, and I was able to land that in. I think actually in that tournament, Nicole shot a huge grouper, and she won first place. Uh, oh, wow. If I think, I think it was the same tournament. So that was a really cool tournament. We did that at the same location. We're doing the next I one at Shake. So, Nicole, you remember that one? Yeah, I got largest so, fish. And I was so stoked, so yeah. lucky. <laughs> she just looked on she looked under the rock and looking at, well i mean nah, so me and my that people easy. that we were in the water with my team we saw like this like grouper in a hole and i shot it and i couldn't believe that like i got him and you know it came out and like it was just like i can't believe like everything connected it was all a, i can tell you is i have a i have a picture of nicole um when she was on the podium you know she she had a smile like from way up here like 
I mean, <laughs> she was so happy. And she was, this is, this is a many years ago. So she was still learning and uh, yeah. I've had the fortune to see, to see Nicole from the beginning to where she's at now. And, it, and she's very impressive. She's come a long, long way. So I'm very happy for her, but I would say that, I mean, I think at the end of the day, that's what really draws us uh, to uh, spearfishing is because every time, every time you go in, it's different. You never know what fish you're going to see. You never know what fish is going to show up. You get some crazy shots that you're like, wow, you know, pretty, pretty cool. So I think one of the draws for spearfishing is that, again, it, every time is different. I mean, the, the water conditions, the depth, the fish, the shots, the camaraderie. Um, that's another thing that I really, really love is I, uh, I call it a rodeo. And uh, usually when we have a nice fish on the bottom and we're using Hawaiian slings or pearl spears for that matter. So um, uh, when everybody gets involved in the process, you know, somebody puts in the first shaft and the groupers in, you know, 65 feet of water and things of that nature. And then the next person comes in and the fish moves to another rock and, and everybody works in tangent. And all of a sudden you got this tribal thing going on with about you know, three, four divers in the water and, uh, and everybody participates in the, in the hunt. Uh, this reminds me of, uh, of a movie. I don't know if you guys seen a 10,000 BC where they go after the big, uh, uh, big elephants and all that stuff. Uh, uh, so it's, it's very cool. That's one of the, one of the things I enjoy the most is those rodeo. I call it again, rodeos. It's fun when everybody participates and lands a trophy fish, it's high five and it's a wonderful feeling. So that's, one of my favorite uh, uh, times is when, when we get when we do that together. Um, do you want to hear one of our like? Uh, I mean, I could tell you the Kubera story if you want, and I kind of want to hear sure. one. Of, Julie's got some really good records, so I want to hear one of her record stories too. So yeah, is that, go ahead. That might be reeling here. <laughs> go, 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 go first. Okay, Nicole. so. Um, I got my Kubera, it's a that's 69 pounder, um, which was phenomenal uh, for where we went. I was so stoked. Um, and we had seen some big ones, um, but they were like, you know, so where I got mine was like on a pinnacle. Um, and actually, I don't know. There were like pinnacles and caves right in that area, but the water visibility was such that for most people, um, you know, the, like for our guide was like, oh, you guys don't even want to go here. You're not going to see anything. But we were like, ooh, dirt water. And we had a marker buoy. So we like marked like the spot, like we had, you know, the sounder and we marked the spot where the fish were. And then, you know, we were taking turns going down on the buoy. So I go down and, and I'm, I'm like, I start to see like a school of snapper, but they're not like so big. And then I like, and then I tuck and then I just see like this mock, like, and so you're not kicking you're you know, you're trying like not even to like look at the fish. You're like just giving it like the side eye. You're like, okay. Like, <laughs> and I just like really slowly. <laughs> reach out and I couldn't believe I was trying to anticipate where it was gonna swim not where it was like not where it was so I kind of put it out and stretch it out in front of it and but here's the thing is that we didn't think that the big ones were gonna be at this spot my boyfriend was like at the time he's like don't bring your we had all these float lines in the water it was like cacophonous the whole day it was like a pain in the butt so I only have like my rife 120 gun and a reel I had that's and that's and and like this, I see like this behemoth and I sh and I'm like oh my god I better get really close or I'm gonna lose my gun and then like the trip is you know the trip's gonna suck because I just lost my gun mm -hmm. so I go and I pull the trigger and I shot it in the head and I was like so stoked and then I'm like fighting it up I'm like kicking the whole way and I'm like and I know there's caves down there so if it like it gets in the caves it's kind of like game over um there were several nice ones shot, but they had been lost to the caves that day. Uh, not by me, but by other people. So I knew like, oh, you better like muscle this up with everything that you have. And then I get it up to the surface and I'm pulling it in. By the time I pulled it in, it's it's lost a lot of power. I'm like, ooh, this is great. 
But what I didn't realize is it almost went all the way through his head. So he almost got away. So like I have my knife out and rather than like trying to, you know, so one trick, if you notice your fish is like almost off is to go and ahead of the fish and stab, get your knife in the fish. So you have one more place to hold it. Um, so that's what I did. And then I just kicked back to the boat and I was really happy. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, that's awesome. That was a shot. Yeah, it was a good day. It was a really good day. And that was like, and also like, that was when I was like, I was getting better, but I wasn't quite yet like super good. So it took like, it was like, a, and I, it was like a really good day for me. I was like diving really deep for, for where I was. And, you know, I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's incredible. And then it was a record. So <laughs> yeah, that's no, awesome. it's, uh, I'm really proud of that record. So, but Julie, tell us about all your good ones. I want to hear about the Cobia. <laughs> uh, I will, but I think we skipped over Susan. Susan, you want to tell the story real quick? Sure. Sure. Uh, so let's see, like Shelby, um, I grew up in a landlocked skit state. Uh, I grew up in Wisconsin. And um, again, like before the world of like social media and Facebook and Instagram, there wasn't really a whole lot, you know, to network. Um, and I did, you know, uh, hunting, fishing. Um, and then I moved to Florida in 2011. Um, I had been scuba diving and recreationally, and then, you know, started to see the fish that I was eating at restaurants in the water. Um, so that's how I got into uh, spearfishing, um, so on scuba. And then I moved back to Wisconsin for a couple years, uh, 2018 to, through uh, 2020. So I definitely know, like, you know, after you've been away from diving for a little bit, you'll get into any water. You know, 30 degrees, 45 degrees, nothing but, like, sand on the bottom, you'll get in the water. <laughs> um, so... I moved back in 2020 and, um, you know, I kind of want to touch on what, what Joe said too, with the camaraderie and just, you know, the friendships and, you know, the whole part of diving that's not just about the fish, but also, you know, the rides out, uh, making new friends, sharing experiences. And so, you know, I've been back in Florida for, you know, maybe like a month or two and I was, you know, just trying to get back in the water any way I could and you know it's the height of COVID so people weren't really like hanging out doing stuff um but I remember like getting you know one of the first few times that I was back on the boat with a spear gun in my hand and I was with you know a, a good group that I've been out with before and I was just like in the water I was killing it snapper hogfish you know I just I, I for me I was just like you know this is awesome this is where I'm meant to be whatever and get back on the boat and I remember like one of the guys being like hey wow um you see you have a GoPro like do you have a YouTube channel and like you know if you know me I'm kind of a humble person so it kind of caught me off guard but I was like oh wow this is really cool he thinks you know I'm decent enough at you know shooting fish to have my YouTube channel you know whatever um but so it's not really I don't really I don't have any world records yet um you know, hopefully someday, but, you know, just, you know, getting out there and doing something that you love and, you know, like catching and, you know, getting food for you to eat and your friends and your family, you know, that's really one of the things that I can absolutely love about this, this sport. And, you know, we're definitely a unique breed, you know, a lot of people are like, why would you jump in water with sharks? Like, why? That, does, that doesn't make any sense, but here we are. We're like, you know, if there's sharks, oh, maybe there's Maybe there's cobia there too you know so yeah yeah for sure absolutely i think that's one of the most fulfilling things about being a spiro or being a fisherman or a hunter or whatever it is just that getting your harvest and enjoying it and uh absolutely do you think you being a scientist um plays a different role or it, it plays a factor in the way you think when you're harvesting fish oh, definitely, or definitely definitely yeah in what way like um i i don't know i mean like when you're when you're um you know on the bottom watching fish go by like you're a little bit more i mean i think 
you know, most of us, you know, most of the ladies here and even, you know, ladies that are, um, you know, spirit fishing women, like we are, you know, we're, I don't want to say elite. I mean, we are elite, but, you know, yeah, you we're, are. We're, we're kind of, <laughs> we're kind of unique. Like we, you know, we're doing things that not a lot of people in general do. And then of that small group of people, unique people, you know, we're females doing it. And so all of us, I think, have more of a sense of objectivity um, than maybe your, your average female. Um, but for me, like it's this, you know, with the scientific background, but one, it's really expensive <laughs> sport to get into. And so having a, you know, a, a good job helps. Um, and then just being, you know, kind of objective and knowing like, hey, you know, that fish you know, it's probably illegal, but, you know, not getting trigger happy, but being like, hey, you know, if I shoot this fish, you know, it's legal, you know, again, touching back on the sustainability part, you know, that helps. And then um, also what like Julie touched in, touched on with the carp, um, like my first introduction to um, like research and science, um, you know, I worked in a freshwater ecology lab studying zooplankton, you know, in the, in the freshwater lakes and, you know, in Madison, Wisconsin. And so, you know, learning the different species and which ones are invasive versus native and how, you know, harvesting a particular species at a particular, um, you know, season, um, how that can affect the entire ecosystem, you know, plays a role into it too. Um, so we have lionfish here in the Gulf, unfortunately, and they're invasive, uh, at least in the Gulf side, they're out a little bit deeper, but they're not, you know, super, super deep on the East Coast, you know, from what I've seen. And, you know, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, like the lionfish derbies um, yeah, yeah. that they have, they're like, you know, they're super, super invasive and they eat just everything. Their rep reproductive rates are just so high and they taste delicious. So, yeah. you know, just... You know, having that that background and that knowledge, you know, and being able to share that with the community and, you know, people that, you know, maybe aren't watermen or waterwomen or haven't had the opportunity to, you know, get out, you know, on the water, in the water, you know, you know kind of a, a fun, fun perspective, you know, it's not just about, you know, killing the biggest fish, you know, all the time, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of other facets. Of course, of course. Well, that's awesome. Uh, Julie, what's that? Uh, what's the Cobia story? <laughs> so Nicole keeps mentioning my records. I have seven records. Uh, four are on, or sorry, five are on pole spear and two are on gun. My two gun records are Gag Grouper and Jack Crevel, and those were both during tournaments. And the rest of them were on pole spear, blackjack, yellowjack, uh, black margate, Cobia, and rainbow parrotfish. And a lot of those fish are shot in the Bahamas, which is why they're on pole spear. But I actually use pole spear here quite a bit also because when I'm in really dirty water, uh, I use a pole spear. I don't, I personally don't like to use short guns because since I load my own guns and I make my own bands, uh, I don't feel like short guns have enough power for me. Mm -hmm. And when you're in really dirty water, you want to be able to see the tip of your gun. So taking that pole spear, um, you know, it really shortens the length in front of your hand to get close to that fish. Uh, so I did a lot of commercial spearfishing for sheepshead in Tampa Bay with Richie Sacker. And I would use my full spear like in the dirty water. I could get really close to the sheepshead. And it was a very quick way to shoot a lot of fish. And so I was spearfishing on a bridge expecting to see sheepshead. And I was laying on the bottom and this cobia swam in front of me. And I knew I, I had a little yellow pole spear. It wasn't, it wasn't a high the pole spear with a belt line, the, the type of equipment setup that you really need to shoot a fish like that. So I was like, well, I guess I'll just shoot this fish. And if I lose my gear, I lose my gear. And luckily I, I had pilings right next to me. So I knew I could hold on <laughs> for a little while. I shoot this right by and it was a really good shot and he weighed 50.4 pounds Woo! he took off super fast and went right into a piling and hit it so hard that he had barnacles uh in his head and oh uh, stunned himself enough for me to get get my hands and in, into the gills and 
Uh, I brought that fish over to the, the boat I was on with Richie Zacker. I think it's 14 feet long. Um, it's a pretty tiny boat. He's like, oh, you better make sure that fish is dead before you <laughs> put him in this little boat. So, yeah, we, make we made sure he was properly dispatched and got him in the boat. And it was a female full spear world record. So it was, it was definitely a cool experience. That's, <laughs> That's crazy. Sure. I've never... Big, big fish, little boat. <laughs> yeah. I've never, I've uh, never heard of it. In the sea. In itself. <laughs> yes, it's, fishing can be expensive. And, and of course it can be, but there's all different levels of gear and boats. And you don't necessarily have to have a lot of money to, to do some basic spear fishing. I, I do a lot of shore diving with full spear. It doesn't really cost me anything. But oh, there's different levels and tiers. If you want to shoot some more serious pelagic fish, then yeah, there's a little bit of money involved. Of course, of but, course. And, you know, another thing is like too, like uh, as far as like getting into the sport, because you know, uh, for women that are interested, you know, uh, everybody's looking for gas money. Like, if you can be someone who like you know is helpful, is there on time, doesn't complain, you know, you know, having so a little bit, you don't have to have money for like a big boat. You just have to have money like to contribute to gas. Um, and, you know, another thing is like, there's so many uh, women's world records that aren't even on the board right now for like, especially for pole spear. Um, you know, if you're just starting out and you're willing to go around with a pole spear, you know, here in Florida or wherever you live, there's probably a record that's not even on the board. So if you go and look at the men's section or any, really any uh, uh, game fish above 10 pounds, um, you can put that on the board and have a record. So get in there, <laughs> do it. <laughs> Absolutely. So there's a lot of opportunity for all you gals listening right now. <laughs> Absolutely. Sure. So last question really for all of you, where do you guys see this team going and what do you guys hope to achieve in the near future? Obviously, the next Worlds is in Spain. You guys want gold, but what is, you know, what other goals do you guys have with this team and in, in general? I'll go last. I'll go first. <laughs> so I think all of us are really excited about this. We have an extremely strong team. All of us, including Shelby, have been competing for a really long time in all different types of tournaments, all different styles and sizes of tournaments. Uh, Roosevelt, who unfortunately wasn't able to do this podcast with us, she holds records for depth uh, and she's been competing for a long time and she's done very well in tournaments consistently. So we're really lucky to have her on the team. She She's there for our depth. Uh, Nicole has experience on world teams. She's, you know, she's done quite a few of these. She knows what's expected and, and how to best prepare. This is my first time on the world team, but I've done several tournaments and I have a pretty good idea of what I'm in store for. So a lot of people who follow these tournaments um, have a lot of confidence in how strong our team is. And we do have a history of first and second. Um, so we're looking to maintain maintain that winning history so i think we're pro all pretty excited about it absolutely yeah Woo. <laughs> sorry <laughs> well yeah anybody want to add anything else or uh i think like in addition to you know all the things that julie just mentioned which are uh super on point um you know i think i myself am uh, so something that's really cool and amazing about doing these tournaments and other places is one, you kind of learn like how little, you know, cause you might know one facet of like hunting styles. So there's so many, you know, we die of a certain way where you live, there's like a certain way to hunt. Uh, and then you can go to somewhere else and like, you know, you're hunting in, you know, whitewash or, you know, you have to like creep around corners or, or like we're here in Florida, you know, if you lay on the bottom and you lay in wait, like things will come into you. Like there's a lot of places where things are not curious, where you might have to go flashing with a little light into a little, like little tiny, look for little tiny cracks. 
Um, you know, so I guess for me to be a more diverse hunter and to learn how to hunt in these alternative conditions is really what my goal is. Sure. I mean, yeah. I think for, I think for me, um, somebody that hasn't been in the saltwater scene very often, I'm, I'm very well known in the freshwater scene, um, but not the saltwater scene at all. <laughs> and so for me, I'm looking forward to this experience um, because I think Nicole was who said it earlier, you learn best with when you're with people that know what they're doing. And so for me to ever be successful in the saltwater scene, I have I have to dive with people that are doing it. Um, and so this is gonna be so exciting for me just to, to really hone in on my diving in a completely different environment. Kind of like Nicole just said, is that's, that's how you learn, that's how you become a better diver is really doing something different, learning new fish, going to a new environment. Um, and so for me, um, as the alternate, I'm excited to be able to get out there and scout and help these ladies succeed and be there if they need me um, and really just come out of it a way better diver and, and really just get my name into the salt water and start and start learning and expanding this sport for myself. So I'm, I'm super honored to be on this team um, because I think for me, I never thought as a, as a girl from Utah that I would get to like dive with these world renowned women um, in Spain. That's like, it's such an honor for me. So I'm, I'm stoked um, and feel very blessed to be able to be a part of it all. Awesome. Susan, wanna say something? Yeah. Um, I won't be competing, but, you know, hopefully in the future, maybe, maybe next year, maybe the year after, but um, I'm excited to be able to, you know, just kind of see the bit or, you know, help shape um, the big picture and, you know, help highlight and um, limelight these awesome women and everything that they've done and they've accomplished and just, you know, help, help, help them pave the way for uh, future Spiros and, you know, just, let everyone know that, hey, you know, these women are awesome. This is what we do. You know, this is how you get into the sport. This is, you know, this exists. I'd Absolutely. say um, I'm excited. Um, I'm very, very excited. Uh, going right back to Julie, uh, my observation is the same. I have the fortune to uh, spearhead the first women's in 2018 and we won the the world's uh, team worlds in 2018 and um, these ladies came in second and I think and I feel that we can very much bring in first place again in Spain now Spain is the toughest competitor competitor and the winningest country in the last you know, history of this turn of the sport. So it's not going to be a piece of cake because we're going to be diving in their territory. But I truly believe that we have the talent uh, that will uh, make that happen. Uh, starting with Rosibel, uh, who's now going to be her third world. Um, I tell you, this will be my third world and I can remember my first world. And it was such electrifying feeling to be on the world stage of spearfishing. This is the Super Bowl of spearfishing, the Super Bowl of spearfishing. For those of you who are listening out there, these women have put in the work of going to nationals, of spearfishing, of dealing with, with horrible weather, of, of, of getting on boats and diving and, and making that effort. That, that is remarkable. It's not easy to stick with it and go to nationals and have those expenses to go to nationals to then ultimately get to worlds. But I think that we're on a cusp of a very, very unique legacy with the historic leadership we've had uh, as far as the women's spirals in the United States, the accomplishments we've already, already realized, not that we're going to realize, that we've already realized. On top of that, the growth of spearfishing in the women, uh, women in spearfishing is, is growing substantially faster than the men's. I mean, I see, uh, I've been around this sport for a long, long time. And the growth of women in the sport is just going nuts. Uh, I think they bring a whole new dynamic perspective in spearfishing. They bring that female component to it. And I really welcome that because I think it just makes the whole sport better. You know, at the end of the day, it's our other half. 
And once you bring women in, I think it's just, just elevates it to a whole new level. That said, my hope for the future is that we have a, a consistent method of, of having funds for these ladies to be able to go to these worlds after they endure the hardship of competing in local tournaments, of going to nationals, of having to, to pay their own way to, to get ranked and be selected for the world team. What I wish for is that we have a good financial foundation that when these women go to worlds, that they can at least know that they're, they're, all their expenses are going to be covered. That is that is my vision, uh, uh, you know, for the men's as well. But I'm focused very much on the women's, and I think we're getting very close to accomplishing that. So, um, and then finally bringing the worlds to the United States. But I think the women are just on an amazing, amazing track, and I'm so excited for these ladies. We have a great potential. I can't wait. Till we get to Spain and uh, and be in that in that world stage. Absolutely, I'm excited to hear all about it and to see what happens then. And uh, I believe you guys have a GoFundMe. Uh, we'll put that for sure in the uh, podcast description. We'll get Thank that you. out. We'll try to push that out for you guys. Definitely want to support our ladies. Uh, all represent- on the gram. <laughs> Absolutely, and on the gram, all over. We'll be putting it out there. We want to support you guys. Um, Thank you so much, all of you, for taking the time. I uh, really appreciate it. I'm super honored to be talking to all of you, um, incredible people, incredible women, you, Joe, incredible individual. You know, you guys are elite. You guys are amazing. And thank you for everything. And, you know, good luck out there this season and everything. All right. Thanks for having us. Thanks for joining us on The Science of Fishing. We hope that this was helpful and you learned something for the next time you're wetting a line. Follow us on Instagram at Science of Fishing. And make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on future episodes and share this with someone you know. Until next time.